Kamala Kieran, I didn't realize you were from Washington, D.C., because when we first connected on social media, I thought that you were actually flying into Boston from India. Like, <laughs> so okay. that's, that's, that's what I thought. So that's why I'm like, I tried to be like, OK, so here's a lift code. Like, this is like, uh, this is yeah. what you want to do. Not sponsored by Live, by the way. But I wanted to, like, <laughs> make, be as hospitable as possible. But now that I know that you're from D.C., I'm like, OK. I, yeah. you know, it wasn't that, uh, how's the flight here? It was good. It was good. It was, I slept the whole time. So oh, as yeah. I tend to do when I travel for concerts. Yeah. So you're actually here for, uh, for a concert, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to be performing at Harvard, yeah. uh, tomorrow. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, it's this conference, um, that they, I guess have every year. I'm actually not, I don't want to quote anything wrong here, mm -hmm. but the singer his name is Sikil Gurchant. So I'm playing in a band with a vocalist and a mridangist. The mm. mridangam is like a double-headed drum uh -huh. in South Indian classical music. So we're giving a two-hour concert tomorrow um, at 6.30. And yeah, it's, uh, it's part of this South Asian conference kind of thing. That's great. So I want to dive into the world of a Carnatic violin sure. because I know nothing about it. <laughs> and I want to learn from you. And I, I'm, I'm definitely going to post like different links and videos <laughs> of you in the podcast show notes so if you're listening definitely uh definitely make sure that you are clicking on those links so that way you have a, some somewhat of a reference of what we're going to be talking about today tell us about carnatic violin because i know nothing our audience is primarily classical mm. and maybe a few carnatic violins but i want to get your take on what uh, carnatic violin playing means to you yeah so carnatic music itself is a south indian form of classical music um and um, so in India, there's North Indian, South Indian music, Hindustani and Carnatic music. Mm -hmm. um, this is the simplest way for, you know, a short podcast. So um, in that, it's primarily a vocal based style. So you learn actually everything that I learn is through ear and I reproduce it vocally first and then I play it on the, my violin. Um, the violin was introduced, I would say, sometime around the 1700s in Carnatic music because of uh, obviously British rule in India. And someone saw, okay, Carnatic music has this thing that we call gamaka. Gamaka is like ornamentation. It's what makes the music sound Carnatic is for the lack of a better word, right? So we don't play straight notes. It's some combination of trills, glissandos, um, all together really fast. So, it, I mean, these are all like rough translations i can't actually say it's equivalent to this in classical music um and they saw that the violin is a there's no frets on the violin so it makes it very easy to do these slides right because we're not our hands aren't obstructed by frets so before that we used to have a fretted instrument called the vena that used to play very popularly it's still a popular instrument but the violin was very quickly adaptable into carnatic music and so since the 1700s really it's been there and now the violin has become an integral part of carnatic music concerts we can do solos we can accompany vocalists we can do duets with different instruments and it's uh, really fun and because it is a western instrument we find a good way of introducing techniques that's also in Western classical music and kind of incorporating that as well. I've learned Western classical as well for the majority of my life. So, Yes, it, this is such a really interesting topic because Carnatic violin is tuned differently. And, mm. you know, same with Arab violin. I had uh, Leith Sadiq. I don't know if you know. Of who course. Yeah, yeah, Leith Sadiq, yeah. wonderful violinist who I had the pleasure of speaking with. Um, on the violin podcast i'll link that episode in the show notes as well but you know he was talking about the different tuning of violin mm -hmm. um, in the arab music world and i want you to talk to us about that in the carnatic music yeah so in carnatic music so the violin itself is tuned okay i'll talk about solos and accompaniment mm -hmm. accompaniment because it's two different art forms so as a soloist <clears throat> there's a certain tension in strings that makes it most comfortable and gives the best tone when we do all the ornamentation we do and that lies around d sharp and e so our tonic note is d sharp or e which means for us that the g string and a string are in octaves and mm. d and e are in octaves and it'll be e b e b so it'll be like e b e b or d sharp what would that be a sharp, D sharp, A sharp, D sharp, A right. sharp. Yes. Right. Okay. That. That's. And what's 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 so interesting because I saw your social media feed like on Instagram and you, you're 
you're posting there pretty frequently and yeah. you have a Facebook page, you have a YouTube channel and I listen to your music and of course, like, you know, I'm familiar with it, but the talk to our audience on how you actually play because it's not the traditional Western classical violin way yeah, of playing, yeah. right? Right. You know, it's a very different technique because of the tuning and a lot of it, you're, you're sitting down for these performances. Correct. So tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, just to quickly add on, if I'm playing accompaniment, then my tonic pitch will be tuned to the vocalist or whoever that is. Mm. So I actually carry two violins because it's not good to keep on tuning one violin back and forth, right? So I have two violins, sure, one yeah. that I use for solos and most male accompaniment and one for female accompaniment. And string choices get very interesting, which is why... Quick side note, I was very interested in your string reviews because I like I actually worked with Tomastic to create really? to create strings that are made for viol like carnatic violin. No way. That's but, so great. But obviously the pandemic has slowed that down, but we're we're still working on that. Anyways, the way we play the violin, um, we sit down um and we rest the scroll of the violin on our right heel. Um there's like this groove in between that little bone and the heel. That's where we rest it. We are not really pushing down, but we just sit. Mm -hmm. And then we play as you would play Western violin, the same bowing technique and everything. Um, the reason we hold it that way is because with the amount of ornamentation that we're doing, it's not like plain notes. If we were to hold it the traditional Western classical way, it would be hitting our neck. Right. Like with the amount of like movement that we do. So we need that pause like we need to be able to rest it so that it's you know we don't have to worry about the violin like falling out or something when we play right because correct me if i'm wrong but i did not see a shoulder rest while you were playing Is yeah i right? don't use a shoulder rest. You don't a shoulder rest yeah. and most carnatic violinists won't use a chin rest either because we're not actually holding it i right it's leverage from your foot right uh leverage from the foot but we're not actually pre pressuring but yeah they don't use the chin rest but i think it just makes the violin look nice so i most of them just take out the chin rest i see okay. but i I like the aesthetic of it. That's okay. why I keep one. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So, no, that, that's how we connected, by the way. is like you reached out to me about the Dynamo strings yeah. recently. Tomastic's not sponsoring this episode, for the record. <laughs> but, uh, no, I did I did a review of the Dynamo strings, like my first reaction. And then I actually got to talk to Jan, who is like product specialist, manager mm -hmm. at Tomastic Infield. And we had a conversation. Actually, he was in Boston. I was invited by... Um, by a local strings company because they, they partnered up. Right, right. And uh, we just kind of geeked out on strings and yeah. kind of like, okay, so this is like the Dominant Pros. Like he he installed the Dominant Pros. Like this is what we were working on three years ago. And then now we wanted a, like the next level up. So this, right. is, this is what was lacking in these strings and this is what was, um, this is what we were trying yeah. to aim for. And, you know, I'm going to be posting a review of the Dynamo after a month and a half, two months of use. So definitely subscribe to the Violin Podcast because I'll definitely link a YouTube video in the podcast show notes as nice. well. I want to get your uh, your history on how you started this Carnatic Violin mm -hmm. because based off what I was reading, it, your was it your grandfather? Yeah, That, my that grandfather. helped you start? Yeah. And everything was taught to you orally, right? As yeah. you mentioned before, yeah? So we don't really have a system of notation. We do. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's... It, nothing to do with staff notation. Sure. It's just, uh, we have seven notes. It's like the solfege. We call it sariga mm mapadani. -hmm. And we just use those. Uh, so S for sa, R for re, that kind of thing. But the thing is, it's really tough to notate any kind of ornamentation. So the way it is taught is really they sing and we play. So the violin, we learn in two ways. We're trying to reproduce all the intricacies they can with the voice. Mm. But then we're also trying to showcase all the intricacies we can do as an instrumentalist. So we have to be able to do both. Um, and so, yeah, my grandfather started teaching me when I was about four or five. Um, then my dad at the age of seven. And uh, with my dad, it was really good. But, you know, sometimes this whole father-son versus teacher-student relationship can get muddy. It can. So then he was like, I'm going to ship you off to India and you're going to learn from like a pro there because you won't be able to pull the crap you do with me here, right? <laughs> Basically. Yeah, I find that to be very tough. I, I know uh, my teach students whose parents are violinists or violin right. teachers. I'm thinking of a couple right now. And it's so tough. It's so tough to teach your kid. Exactly. So like even me as a father now, I'm thinking like, am I going to be teaching my son violin <laughs> or do I have to really like maybe lay down the foundations of technique first and then have him yeah, learn from someone else. Exactly. Yeah, I, yeah so I, I definitely know what you're coming so from. So I went to India then for 
a year hmm. to okay. learn from uh, Kanyakumari. Uh, please do look her up. She is world renowned. She has like country, like the National Award of India and like all of those things. She's, you know, so world renowned violinist there. And I went in 2006 and I was there for one year got training from her and then I since then I've been learning from her over like the phone or whatever it's like these phone classes where we put it on speakerphone because she doesn't believe in zoom because she, or skype because there's a lag when you do that especially with the rhythm mm -hmm. she finds it easier over the phone so we just put it on speaker and then she'll sing I'll play I'll play she'll play that but kind that, of thing but, that, but that's really convenient because I mean you are getting taught orally anyway mm -hmm. so you're so you're listening so it doesn't matter exactly. I think that's the one disadvantage of being a, a Western classical violinist is because we're also dependent on the visual um, right. technique on right hand and left hand. But yeah, and the thing is, the technique foundation that's why I went in India for a year mm -hmm. to like so that she could lay that in. And then my dad's at home, so he can take care of the technique as well. And I learned Western violin, so the technique was drilled in, and I found a way to adapt that. So, like the bow hold and certain things that we do with the bow that might not be the same way. I find it helpful for Carnatic, so. Um, and then, yes, and I've been performing and ever since. So, yeah. Yeah. Talk to us about your typical performance um, schedule and like, how do you like, are you performing with the same people like in the, in like in the Indian Carnatic music circuit? Or are you playing with different? No. So another thing time? is a lot of Carnatic music is improv based. So mm -hmm. we have couple set compositions, but we do a metric improv, rhythmic improv, like so many things <laughs> that we don't really need to rehearse. We just meet on stage. We know the music. We It's almost like a jazz kind of ad lib situation that's going on. You all kind of just give a look and we're like... We know what's it. going on. Sure. As long as, you know, you're at that, you know, you have reached that level where you can do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, no, it's not the same person. I'm playing with someone tomorrow. I'm playing with someone else this Saturday. I'm giving a solo in a week. Obviously, solos are more my music. So, and the others, I'm like, we're working together. And even a solo... It, has percussion accompaniment but yeah basically every weekend i'm performing and right. then in december there's this thing called the music season that happens in chennai a place in south india and you know if you think of baseball season or basketball season this is literally that there's over the people from all over the world come to the city and there's over a thousand concerts on any given day across the yeah there's that many venues and like if you're if you're watching this my mouth has dropped i <laughs> yeah. that's a lot of content and, and i'm there's no one thousand in that one day in a day at least um that's you know wild there's so many because it starts from the morning till night okay mm -hmm. and there are at least 100 venues that keep it so you can assume 110 concerts even if you keep five concerts you're getting 500 at the minimum so you have so many concerts and how you do it is you work your way up. So you start in the morning slot. Then as you get more popular, you go to the evening slot. So, you know, when I went in 2009, I'd go every year. I started in the morning slot and now I play the evening slots and it's really fun. Like people from all over the world and it's almost a month and a half of nonstop music every day. Wow. So yeah, you. I mean, but you worked towards that. Of course. Yeah. So, so I had to go every year. I'd actually take off from school couple because I'm, I'm 25 now yeah so when i went in 2009 10 even through high school um and sometimes even college i would it's in december so i'd have to i'd get all my concerts by this time maybe by the summer so when school starts in september i'd have like the list of concerts ready a note with all these signatures saying i have to be a lot to go and then i would take like my work to india and i'd like perform and then do homework from there <laughs> wow so how long would you be in india for for this for this festival so around so now i go november to february because i have that leeway uh -huh. but during school and all i would go i think december 10th on yeah on, like a month jan 10th so i'd be missing a week here and a week there kind of thing as you mentioned yeah, it's a whole season it's a whole season it's a whole season of concerts so approximately how many concerts would you be performing like during the season about 40 so if i'm there for a month i'm performing every day and sometimes mm -hmm. i'm performing two concerts a day it's like a marathon kind of thing yeah and remember carnatic concerts are kind of long <laughs> yes oh my god okay <laughs> first first of all like i played with um people from mumbai last august um vijay prakash oh yeah, yeah. Vij i know vijay prakash very well i've yeah. played with him before yeah so i played on stage with vijay very nice uh vijay prakash last summer like all the Bollywood hits, <laughs> which right. was great. And 
though that was long man that was really like three I th- it's like as long as an op, like four hours we were on stage. Yeah. Three and a half to four hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what though? Those people in the audience, they are sitting through it. They're sitting through it. Now, they're like, they're there. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you have marathon concerts, not all of them are that long, but I'd say two hours is a minimum. Wow. So, yeah. So, it's 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 incredible though because you really get to show what you've worked on mm-hmm. over the year and like, it's really how you get your name out there. There. You may or may not know this violinist. We've been trying to get her on the violin podcast for a while now. I think just because of the time difference, and uh, she was actually performing um, on this concert with Vijay Prakash la- okay. uh, last year. Shruti, Shruti Sarathi. Yeah, yeah, a very good friend. Oh my gosh! So yeah, I I wanted to get her on the violin podcast for so long. It just that just so happens. We give duets all the time. Actually, on my Instagram, if you go the recent the most recent post that I have is of a duet of me and Shruti. Oh my gosh! Okay, so, I'm gonna have to watch that. She's yeah, so yeah. lovely. I met her when she because they flew everybody from Mumbai for this concert for the week, and I got to get to know her. And she was talking about how, you know, there like you say, there is no way to notate, mm-hmm. you know, your style of music. But she has her own language and yeah. her own way of notating. Do you happen to do that also? Yeah. Where, like so. there are like certain there are certain things that like if there's like a a melody that everybody is familiar with and. You know, yeah, you have to there are. It, yeah. As I said, you use the solfege syllables, mm-hmm. sari gama padani, and then if you, the way is if I can imagine the curve going like this, like I saw that. On then her, I can do music. that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I do that, but again, it can only translate about sixty percent of what's in my mind. Mm. So ten years down the road, if I go back and look at my notation, I at least this is for me. Maybe hers is more standardized for myself. My musicality has changed in 10 years. Sure. So of course. that curve could mean so many things in 10 years. So it's not as set as... And you could say the same thing about Western classical music too. You're not really just reading the notes per se. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of interpretation too, like how you interpret d- dynamics and all of that. A crescendo could mean whatever in 10 years than what it meant then. It might just be getting louder when you're a student, but... Sure, and it, it can vary from composer to composer, exactly. too. Like a, like a crescendo diminuendo in Brahms. Very right. different, you know, very different meaning versus a crescendo diminuendo in, I don't know, like uh, Rachmaninoff, for instance. Exactly. You know, like and, very different. And when I was learning as a student, it was more get louder, get softer. And now there's so many more dimensions to that, right? Mm-hmm. So it's still a lot less... <laughs> laid out as it is in Western staff notation, but we do have our own methods for ourselves. I want to circle back what you said about learning uh, violin at an early age. Was that your decision or was that a decision kind of like your family? Because it seems like you grew up in a family of right. musicians. So I would say that there could have been this expectation for you to play. Oh, there 1,000% the- was. There, oh, there was an expectation? There was 1,000% an expectation. Actually, I gravitated more towards the Murdangam, which is the double-headed drum in Carnatic music. Feel mm-hmm. free to look it up. Um, it's is that, is that similar concert. to tabla? Tabla, put it together. Yeah. And sideways. Like, it's like, I mean, that's just so you can visualize it. I see. Okay. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I had no problems with learning, but mm-hmm. I couldn't say, I wouldn't say I fell in love with it immediately. I always tell my parents, I'm like, what would you have done if I didn't like it? But, you know, I did like it. So it worked out. I mean, I saw my dad perform on stage and I definitely wanted to be him. So it wasn't one of those things where it was like, oh, I'm going to force you to do it. No, it was, they started it. I did it. You know, I was okay about it. And then I started getting good at it. And I was like, hey, this is nice. And then I started meeting people. And then it's, I think how every kid really gets into music. It's right? kind of like whatever happens. Whatever happens. happens. I just happens. wanted the introduction and then... So the introduction the was expected. Okay. It worked out such that I really liked it and I'm now doing it in a pretty, you know, it's more than a full-time job for me. That's really <laughs> It's like a cool. lifestyle. So Being a musician really is a lifestyle. You know, there is a, a, lot, of, a lot of failures that you have to be comfortable with. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, of course our musical journeys may be kind of different in the expectation of the education. Um, there is, I don't know how to explain it. I feel like, you know, I, you know, as a perspective, as a teacher, I'm always thinking about how can I help this, not make it so rigid, this education, meaning like mm. have this kind of back and forth. Yeah. And it seems like in your, in your style of music, there is a lot of back and forth. You are talking to your mentor, your mentor is trying to give you ideas and, 
you're kind of bouncing off as from each other rather yeah. um it's very sometimes it can be one directional uh teaching like in, in western classical like okay this is the style this is mozart this is how you should play because yeah. this was taught orally and i think a... i think in the beginning that some amount of that is needed before the student you know you need to this is how you hold the bow right like there's no back and forth here this, this is how you hold the bow yeah you have like, to have the basics first in order to have fun exactly later on. yeah and i could say that same thing here as a teacher now i also teach a lot i have a lot of students um and i perform with a lot of them so i always it's one of those things i mean people always say you learn a lot by teaching and it's true mm -hmm. especially in carnatic music i feel that because you can give them a framework on how to improv you know there's there are these rules right for sure we have these things called ragas that's what define carnatic music so each raga and don't get me started on how many ragas there are <laughs> <laughs> that's another podcast episode <laughs> exactly but in order to learn how to improv, you need to know the rules for each raga, right? Mm. And it takes a long time to learn those rules. But then there's a certain amount of freedom. So really what ends up happening is sometimes when a student calls me for feedback or if I call my teacher for feedback, this is about the feedback I can give. Okay, you checked all the rules. Now, what you've improv here, I personally wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like you want to do that, I can't stop you. That's really your expression there. But for me, it didn't work. It's about how this is how the conversations go on. Yeah, I think you have to have a student at that kind of musical maturity level in order to say that. Exactly. Right. Like I would not say that to a six year old learning Suzuki Book One. Right. I, would, I would definitely say that to someone who is definitely playing Mozart. Like I, I have a student in my head who's playing Mozart Violin Concerto Number Three, G Major. And like that's not something that I would do. Right. This is the framework. Like, go off of that framework and see if you can push the limits a little bit. Exactly. Because otherwise, if we, if we, I don't want to treat my students like they're in some kind of factory. Exactly. Actually, it's funny because I had this conversation with a friend yesterday. I was meeting him up. Um, we both attended the same violin school. He's not a, vi you know, not violinist anymore, like full time, like I am. But we talked about sometimes we are in this bubble where we can be in some sort of factory where you, this is the repertoire list that you're expected to play. And then this is the, like these are the skills that you will learn through this repertoire and then I'm going to, you know, go off and then, you know, you figure it out. <laughs> right, right. Which um, which is uh, another, again, another topic for another time. <laughs> but <clears throat> how can people learn more about you and how can people stay connected with you? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on Instagram now. I was really bad at it. See, one thing that Carnatic musicians are not good at is <laughs> the whole social media thing. Yeah. But ever since the pandemic, I've gotten better. So yeah, my Instagram is, I, I post most, most of my concert updates on there. Um, and then, I, yeah, Facebook is huge, at least for India artists. So yeah, I definitely keep my social media updated. Um, so you can definitely catch my performances there. And then YouTube is always, if I'm posting, I'm posting. If not, almost every concert now, someone has a phone or a video and they just end up post. So I put type my name and I'm like, oh, when did this video come out? Like I had no idea. So, but yes, definitely if you want more controlled stuff by me, uh, my Instagram is the way to go. Yeah, you're the one actually posting the stuff rather than somebody else. Correct. The, the mediocre footage. Exactly. So yeah, that's great. And Kamala Kieran, this is... I, I learned so much today and I hope that our audience learned a lot today. Yeah, thank you so much Carnatic for having music. me. No, it's my pleasure. I love meeting new people and I love making new friends. And I'm in I'm in your part of the country in DC and Virginia yeah. pretty often. So hopefully we can meet up, maybe for do this sure. one more time and yeah. and uh, maybe we can collaborate on a, on a YouTube video or something. Absolutely, <laughs> that'll be fun. I would actually, uh, maybe offline we'll take this chat, but would talk to you about, you know, what, because you're a string geek and I'm a string geek. Sure, yeah. And, you know, that's one constant challenge for Carnatic violin because although <clears throat> we're an Indian where we're using an Indian style, we're using a Western instrument. Yes. So all the equipment is Western right. oriented for what's optimal for Western tuning. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm doing research where I'm wondering, okay, where can I adapt this so that it can get that same optimal tone? Maybe you have to make like I don't know what changes has have to be made, but mm -hmm. I've worked with, as I said, I've worked with these string companies. I have a bunch of prototypes, and um, hope to we'll we'll talk half, we'll, offline. We'll talk. We'll talk <laughs> off, offline. Yeah. Kamala Kiran Vinja Moody. We, I'll put his social media information in the podcast show notes. So definitely check him out. He his playing is wild. It's exciting and it's great. You can find him everywhere online. So uh, please be sure to check him out. Kamala Kiran, thank you. Thanks for so much everything. for yeah. Thank. Thank you for this chat. Really appreciate it. Of course. It. Thank you.